Great. Thanks, Paul. And thank you, everybody, for attending today. We have a very exciting webinar um, and thrilled to introduce today's speakers. Just uh, briefly, if you're not familiar with Clavis Insight and One Click Retail, um, together we have we are creating the definitive source for e-commerce insights. Both Clavis Insight and One Click Retail are under the common ownership of Essential, um, following our acquisition at the end of last year, and are working together on developing solutions for uh, brands to help with their e-commerce analytics, data, and insight solutions. Um, each of us provides a different set of uh, solution relative to the digital shelf, what we call 6P's e-commerce intelligence, as well as a, a deep Amazon solution, including sales and share uh, for Amazon from one-click retail. Uh, to, next slide. Uh, together, we uh, work with over 10,000 of the world's largest brands in every region of the world. And if it's something you would like more information about, there will certainly be some uh, in contact information at the end of the webinar today, and, and we hope you will reach out. With that, let's jump into the content for our webinar today. We are thrilled to be joined by Ankit Patel of Boxed and Megan Bowman of OneStone. Um, Ankit is currently Director of Merchandising for Boxed.com. Uh, he's held merchandising and supply supply chain roles at Box and currently leads the buying teams whose primary focus is assortment and developing vendor partnerships. And I know that we will get into a little bit more about Box and some of their latest initiatives as we get into the into the presentation today. Uh, as for Megan, she is CIO at One Stone E-commerce Solutions, uh, which is a solution for brands and, and helping with optimizing and driving their business uh, in the e-commerce channels. Uh, she has quite a bit of experience, as you can see here, um, running various platforms and solutions for ranging from Amazon to Walmart and everything in between. With that, uh, let's jump into today's presentation. M Megan? Hi guys, thanks for having us. This is Megan Bowman with OneStone. Um, a quick um, just shout out to, uh, to what OneStone does. First of all, thanks for joining us. Um, while Clavis and OneClick um, really do pull out insights really well, um, our team technically uh, manage, is a managed services group. So once you've got the insights, like what do you do? Um, and at, at OneStone, we run a, um, a play that we call ADM, Architect, Drive, and Measure. And essentially, we become the hands and feet um, of not only your Amazon platform, but, but all the other platforms um, in between. So um, we've, got a, we've got a robust workforce, and um, we love uh, executing strategies, uh, building strategies, and then executing them as well. Ankit? Hey everyone, um, I uh, think I know a couple of you on the call, and if you guys don't, I'll give you. We'll go into a little bit more detail of uh, what Box is, but uh, essentially, just uh, quickly, um, you know, I've been at Box for two years, leading the merchandising and vendor management teams now, so working with all our vendor partners. Um, again, I'll go over the overview, and we'll get into a little bit more detail later. But uh, just uh, hello, and thanks for joining, and thanks for having me. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and dive in. Um, you know, one thing that as, uh, as Danny and, and Paul and I were figuring this out, um, a lot of you guys are, are really focused on Amazon. Um, it takes a distorted amount of resources. It's a complex beast. Um, and at the same time, there's just a lot of opportunity um, if you play it well and potentially a lot of opportunity to use um, some of your learnings um, across platforms. I know not everybody here um, has one um, – uh, consolidated center of excellence. However, um, hopefully this will, will spark some ideas on how you can um, expand either within your organization um, or, you know, formally or informally. So today's roadmap um, is it, it's going to be a lot of basics. Um, and again, I, I, I am, our team is all about the execution and, and running the basic plays. Um, the cool thing about being online is uh, the more times you touch it and the more times you uh, react, the better. And so um, running the basics over and over and over again is a great play. Um, today's roadmap is um, we'll talk about creating the best online offer, how you do that. Um, it takes a lot of detail and discipline, and there's kind of four subject, four sub pieces to that. Uh, know your universe, know your numbers, know your neighbors, and need all the details. We'll go into that. Um, the other piece is one size doesn't fit all. We'll hear from Ankit, um, as he is the, the extraordinaire on box. Um, and then uh, just some examples of how to mar uh, maximize um, particular platforms to grow shares, uh, sales and share. At the same time, as you're coming up with questions, go ahead and send them in. 
Okay, so the big question I have for you guys is what is your universe? Um, there's a difference between the catalog um, and, and really what's in the, the universe. Um, there's always more than what you think um, inter third party. So basically when your brand shows up online, it doesn't matter if it's there because you guys loaded it um, or um, it's in a weird configuration um, because uh, somebody else loaded it or um, I always like to talk about how um, Betty Closet Store 216 is um, probably selling more of your product sometimes than you are in, in particular platforms. Um, the other pieces is that you might have products out there that you've had an exclusive brick and mortar launch with. Um, I'll, I'll make a, a, a Kroger exclusive. And at that point, um, as soon as um, Betty Closet Store 216 buys it from Kroger on closeout and puts it on her third party store or, or, uh, or eBay, all of a sudden that product is technically yours again. Um, and then also um, product that you've closed out to a distributor through a channel play. Um, so your universe is bigger than you think. And when we work with clients, a lot of times we just, we do um, what's called a, a hunt and peck. And we literally uh, go in through Google, go in through Amazon, go in through Facebook Marketplace. And we want to really find out where everything is. Um, why does it matter? It's your brand and your product. And consumers um, who are searching don't care if it's being sold by Betty or sold by you. Um, they just don't think that way, um, as many of you guys know. And one thing I, I love, um, a, a buddy of mine in the industry, Patrick Miller, talks about um, that every ASIN on Amazon is like a little child. You have to love it and care for it and take care of it pretty much throughout its lifespan. And when I talk to my team about the universe, I say, just because you aren't claiming the child doesn't mean you don't own child support. So um, this is one piece that... Um, you got to know what your universe is and you got to get it organized. Another thing in terms of what's in your universe is um, the different pack variations. And so while um, you have one major, um, uh, know your numbers, you've got one major um, pack or one major item, it can fly through in so many different variations just by nature of the way it flies out of a warehouse. And so it's really important to make sure that you know um, not only your main SKU that you're trying to, to sell, but also all of the variations. So when I work with clients, um, and our team works with clients, we literally, we usually take about a 48 SKU quote unquote catalog or kind of their master brand universe and blow it out to all the variations it could possibly be. Then we add on all of the third parties who are selling it and all of the products that are um, potentially discontinued or not part of the, um, the natural dam or PIM uh, in-house. Um, because again, uh, as brand managers, we think that whatever we put out is exactly what people are buying. And when you get on the other side of the screen, people are experiencing our brand in so many different ways that, that we always want to be, I, I tell our team, I, I'd rather be um, aware and not surprised we don't have to know um, how to handle everything, but nobody on my team should ever be asked, oh, I found this online, and, um, and they say, oh, it's you know, three or four years old, it's not part of our catalog, and I say, no, actually, it is part of our catalog. Whether or not we do anything with it is, is another thing, but we do need to know um, where everything is. Uh, in terms of um, what's in your universe, I always say know your neighbors. Um, I, I use the telescope, binoculars, magnifying glass, and microscope as an, as an example. A telescope is look far. Google, Slick Deals, eBay, et cetera. Again, if it's your child, you've got to pay child support on it somehow. Binoculars get a little bit closer. The platforms you actually play on and are being intentional with. So you've got your universe, and then you've got your kind of your catalog for each platform, and that's different assortment strategies, um, you know, honestly, different third parties who are playing with you on the platform if you're in the, the Walmart space or the Amazon space. Um, then I say take a, take a magnifying glass and make sure you see the details of what's actually happening on every single platform. So that's really getting in your back end, it, whether it be vendor central or supplier center or EdgeNet if you're in the Lowe's system. Whatever it is, make sure that you know all of the details of what's happening on your current catalog in the current platform. It sounds really basic, but it's the type of stuff that people get tripped up on all the time. And so when we talk about going the best online offering across all platforms, it's really important to know what each platform is what each platform is doing from the beginning so you can build a strategy that's off of um, a, a benchmark, a basic line. The next item is, um, is we use a microscope. 
And what I say is get to know the how it got there. So when you use a microscope, you're looking at molecules and DNA. And I think it's really important um, to understand if, if a random product that's yours, whether intentionally or unintentionally, is somewhere in the universe, um, that, you, that you kind of trace it back and know how it got there. Again, you don't always need to do anything about it, but the fact that you know it's there and you know potentially the inventory positioning, um, the relationship, how it got there, if you've got a leaky uh, sales channel or a leaky distributor channel, those are all important things because you'll probably root cause those as your, um, the life cycle of your multi-platform um, evolves. And the classic, um, who cares? Like, what's in your universe? Why do you care? Um, it seems like a lot of extra work. Um, a lot of times we have it on you know, spreadsheets in the different brand managers' locations. Um, we, we don't always have great um, uh, PIMs or DAMs or, or just basic kind of truths that our, that our large manufacturers are um, pulling out of. And so what I say is um, you have a really cool opportunity. And the reason being is um, the more you know about where your brand and your product is, the more you'll be able to fight in the future. So when we think about voice, um, when we think about things like Google Shopping or even, you know, a more aggressive Amazon third-party play, um, gosh, down into eBay and Facebook Marketplace, all of those places, people are just saying, I need X. And when they say, I need X, depending on how those search algorithms work, and I know Danny and the team at Clavis and OneClick are a lot more um, astute at these things, um, anything can rise to the top. And so what I always tell my team is I want to make sure that if it's rising to the top, that you know which, which item in our, in our entire universe is going to be rising to the top. And if, it's, if we're surprised, we're not doing our job in terms of the details. Um, I'm going to go through one more little exercise in terms of what's in your universe, and that is to know your natural habitat. I've worked with clients who, um, who stay really singularly focused on Amazon, um, which is not a bad play. Um, it's definitely the one you have to get right first. Um, and then I've got... Um, manufacturers who um, just want to play everywhere, and they want to play everywhere all at the same time. And typically, they put, it, um, they put Amazon under one group, and then they give everything else to somebody else. And um, one thing, I, you know, as we all know, each platform has different specifications, but you can really get duplicative in terms of um, the assets that you're creating, and, you know, you need to have some distinction between the platforms at the same time in, term, in terms of where you're sitting from an internal perspective, um, there's some really clever ways to make sure that, um, that you're not over, you know, you're not overusing um, asset budgets, et cetera. Oops. So what I always tell some clients that I start to work with is let's make sure we map out where we want to be playing. Let's find out where we are playing, whether or not we know it, um, and then let's make sure that we're going to the right place given our category, our competition, um, and other marketplace forces. So I'm just going to whiz through here. So Tide, um, if it's lit up, that's where, um, you know, that's, that's a strategic move. But of course, we always use Tide because that's the e-commerce go-to um, in terms of examples. Sorry, sorry Proctor. <laughs> um, dog Chow, you're going to play in different places. Uh, Xbox, again, different places, different platforms. Obviously, Amazon has the, the corner market, and you've got to get that right. Um, but in terms of creating um, additional platforms and knowing the assets to use on those platforms, um, that's a whole different, different ballgame. Bananas. Um, you start to play down in the Instacarts and the, the ship and all of those, the Walmart um, pickup grocery, all of those are set up in different tech stacks. Um, and so again, having a, a good spot where all of your assets are or working with a team that can help you get those assets so that they can easily be deployed um, is, is probably a, a good investment. It doesn't have to be expensive, um, but it does take discipline. Uh, Nike, we love it. Basketball hoops, different places. And of course, water. Oh, we've got one more because we got to call it Hay Needle um, and Wayfair. So we've got a chair. So again, this is just an example of the major platform players, um, both current and emerging, and how you're obviously not going to play on every platform, but to know which platforms you're going to play on, how, when, and why. This is an example of um, it's a it's a for presentation only, so don't don't look too deep. Um, but across the top in green, we have um, the different platforms. Um, so it looks like uh, Walmart.com, Walmart, um, 
grocery pickup, which is actually a different tech stack. Um, Amazon First Party, Amazon Prime Pantry, again, different tech stacks. Amazon Business, Amazon Third Party, Jet.com, Costco.com, Box, SamsClub.com, and Kroger. And you can see on the left in the yellow that that's the entire, at this point, that's the catalog. So the universe would be much larger because it's a bunch of additional players that we're just trying to keep track of where they are and what they're doing. But everything in yellow on this particular page is part of a known catalog. It's an assortment strategy that brand managers or channel managers got together and said, we're going to sell this in this place, and here's why. And what I want you to see in this is that um, there's just a lot of different places and ways that you can play. You can duplicate and you cannot, given the fact that you're also adding in all of your um, inner packs and outer packs. So making sure that you've got variation there. Um, there's a lot of tips and tricks around this, especially when it comes to price matching, um, shadow, pseudo UPCs, those sorts of things um, are all tactics that are used um, in order to manage your, your uh, assortment across multiple platforms. The other thing is, um, and we talked about it a little bit before, is to make sure that you've got a plan and that you stick to it. Um, and so this slide really shows um, down at the bottom that there is complementary asset overlap requirements, whether it's number of character counts, whether it's um, image DPI, whether it's um, size, whether it's number of images. Um, and I'm just talking the basic content. I'm not talking rich content, but just the basic parts of your catalog. You can also cross-reference other platforms within your listings um, which, again, raises your overall search um, and discoverability um, across, across everything. Um, but really understanding where you're going, when, how, and why, and in what order. So a lot of times you can run um, kind of a rehab strategy on one platform, but then you're going to have to um, make sure that you stop and rerun it again on another platform. Um, and so this is just an example of, of uh, one roadmap that we made in terms of um, when we were going to be moving. And then the next is just don't forget the details. Good, e good online retailing is good online retailing. It doesn't matter if you're on Amazon or Walmart or Costco or Boxed or wherever. Make sure that you're taking care of your basics um, because if you take your eye off Amazon and start really focusing on other platforms without taking care of something as simple as your EDI transmissions on Amazon, um, you'll be in trouble. And so it's, um, I'm asking you guys to do a lot and think about a lot, but the idea is there's just some basic principles, and once you establish those basic principles and start working those basic principles across all the different platforms, um, uh, your, your whole engine starts to sing in conjunction with you knowing what all else is happening, not only with your competition, but within your own brand um, with all of those illegitimate children hanging out there. As you guys know, um, the share is always shifting. Um, and one of my most exciting um, meetings that I've been to this year has been up at Box with Ankit. Um, so we brought him in to kind of walk us through the Box journey. There's a lot of news going on there. And um, talk about a, a platform that requires a different strategy um, and, and really a different way to approach. Um, Ankit is, um, is going to bring that to us. Cool. Thank you, Megan. Um... I got to see if I can click through the slides. Okay, here we go. Okay, cool. Yeah, so again, guys, uh, thanks for having me. i um, looking forward to uh, telling you guys a little bit more about Box and, of course, answering your questions. And um, if you guys have questions, please post them. And then uh, as there's follow-ups, we'll, uh, of course, we can connect after this meeting as well. Um, yeah, so just a little bit more about Boxed. Um, I, if, if you guys do business with us today, uh, thank you very much. And um, some of this content may be a little repetitive, but I uh, wanted to give you guys a little bit more insight and give you the uh, Boxed overview before we get into some of the details. So, um, you know, when we think about the space that we play in, you know, we never butt up against Amazon, right? We're not trying to race against Amazon. We're just, we're just. Um, Finding a niche in the market and um, capitalizing on it. So, uh, when you think about the opportunity today, um, we look at it from a club perspective, right? So, the club business is a two hundred billion dollar industry, right? So, Costco, Sam's, and BJ's, uh, three players, and uh, you know, two to about three percent is probably done in e-commerce and zero percent on mobile. So, you know, there's a big pie there, and at the end of the day, that's essentially where Box fits in. Uh, we all know that everything is kind of changing 
Um, mobile plays a big part of it. So um, I think five years ago, six years ago, when the concept of Box started, uh, it started as app only, um, you know, uh, a retail store. So no web browser, no desktop. So you, in a lot of ways you think, you know, they're probably five, six years ahead of their time. Uh, and of course we've transformed over the way, but, you know, mobile is a part of our life and I don't, view it as going away, and I think, if anything else, um, that is always going to increase. And, you know, every Black Friday, Cyber Monday, we hear the reports of mobile traffic increasing, desktop, you know, traffic decreasing, and, you know, we could probably see those trends continuing. So overlaying the club opportunity with the mobile opportunity, that intersection is where we play, and that's, that's where Box is. Um, so a little bit more about Box. Uh, so the, the journey that we've been on for uh, almost the last five years, uh, year one, uh, we started in the garage. Uh, there's four, four founders uh, and a small team. Um, you know, they started in the garage just like every great company does, right, like the Apples and everyone else. So um, that was literally the first fulfillment center. So you could see the racking. If you can take a look at that picture, uh, you could see all the inventory. And then eventually as the assortment grew and, and the business got bigger, the, the assortment – or the, the uh, items spread out into the kitchen, into the basement, into the bedrooms. So um, eventually, you know, the, 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 the concept was being proven out and we, and we were growing. So a uh, year or two, we were, again, really focused on a lot on proving the concept out. Um, is this something that consumers want? And, you know, we're slowly finding that it is. So uh, expanded into our first warehouse in Edison, New Jersey, 8,000 square foot facility. Uh, year three, we're looking at really scaling the business. So um, a fully national footprint optimized logistics, so we're opening four distribution centers in Jersey, Atlanta, Dallas, Vegas. And then today, um, you've probably seen a lot of uh, stuff on the news in terms of, you know, warehouse automation. Uh, so our union facility is, you know, one of the best-in-class CPG facilities and fully automated, um, and, you know, it's really essentially scaling for the future. So um, we've really invested a lot into capital and uh, resources um, to ensure that, you know, we're really scaling this business at the, at the right pace. Um, a little bit more after four years. So um, fast shipping, right? So we replicate a lot of what the Amazon Prime model is. You know, 95% of our orders are delivered in two days. 55% are delivered in one day. Uh, no membership. So you guys maybe caught wind of the news, but we can talk a little bit more about membership later. So we've introduced some uh, membership tiers. However, the requirement of a membership uh, is, is, is still uh, zero. Um, our AOV, so our average order value is $100. So um, this is a lot different when you group boxed versus the other e Player. So, you know, I, I believe Amazon is roughly a $24 AOV with 1.4 units of order. You know, we're about 100 with 8 to 10. So we really drive bundling, uh, stock up. Um, so, it, you know, and a lot of it, you know, it, it helps, of course, the economics downstream as we, we ship it in one box. Um, something else that's different about us than Amazon is browse versus search. So um, a lot of times consumers who go to Amazon are looking for something specific. They're searching for it. They're going to it. They're clicking. They're checking out. Um, and for us, consumers actually browse. Um, so they're actually going category to category. They're scrolling down to the bottom of the category. And roughly 80% of our traffic is done via browse than search, which is almost the inverse uh, of what Amazon does. Um, for exponential growth, of course, you know, I think, um, you know, we're, we're, we, we've experienced a great growth curve there, and that, that continues. Uh, five, from a merchandising standpoint, we are a curated assortment. So we are very similar to the club um, where, you know, we'll have one item of, of a brand versus creating a tail. Uh, and then lastly, six, um, we've had a ton of traffic, a lot of consumer interest. So, you know, I think this number probably needs updating, but I think this was about, as of last year, we've had over 4 million app downloads. Um, so when we think about the landscape in terms of, like, you know, where does Box fit in, um, you know, I think today a lot of um, – you know, a lot of the CPGs and, and a lot of the vendors and suppliers and manufacturers, they essentially view e-commerce as e-commerce, right? And I think 
Megan did a good job of going through like different items and essentially where where you play and how you got to like think about your strategy. Um, but even the stuff that I just went through in terms of how our consumers shop and operate and behave differently than an Amazon customer, um, you know, there's a lot of differentiation there. So very similar to how brick and mortar has progressed over the years, right? So you have Walmart, you got your masks, and you got a ton of assortment there, and then you got Publix and your grocery, um, you got your dollar stores, and then you got kind of your club, right? And there's there's a little bit of overlap, but every um, every retailer serves a different need, and that's really the way online is eventually going to uh, – that, 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 that's the way it is playing out, right? So, of course, you have Amazon that's the everything store, um, and you have, you know, Wayfair, who, do, who services a different need, and that's kind of what Box does, right? And we're absolutely seeing that, right, in terms of, again, going right back to our order, the customer behavior, customers are behaving differently on Box than they are on Amazon. So um, we view that, like, you know, you know, the concept that we – you know, implemented and went out to prove out, yes, it's working. And two, like, you know, we have great repeat rates and we have, we have very loyal customers, so they're coming back. Um, but at the end of the day, like, you know, as you guys think about your e-commerce strategy, like, you need to break that down, really. It's not an e-commerce strategy. It's what's your Amazon strategy. It's what's your Jet strategy. It's what's your Omnichannel strategy. It's what's your Box strategy. So that's a, a very big differentiator. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so I think it's really time to think differently, right? And that's kind of the, you know, the, the, what the previous slide is saying is that um, your strategy needs to be different. We are different. We are not the Amazon. Box customer is not the Amazon customer. We have a curated assortment. Um, our, you know, purchase behavior is different. Our order size is different. The browsing is different. So at the end of the day, we're different. And it's very important for teams to internalize that and really create different strategies around it. Two, um, from a merchandising uh, standpoint and a um, vendor standpoint, like we, we truly believe in collaboration, right? So uh, I absolutely view, and this is what I tell our teams all the time, is that two is greater than one. And uh, the CPGs have very valuable insights. They have amazing knowledge. Uh, and that's stuff that we need to capitalize on. And at the end of the day, you know, we – so I think if we have a joint vision um, and we're working towards the same objectives, I think our goal, like, we can achieve, we can achieve greater things. Um, so from an, you know – Experimentation standpoint, from a data standpoint, you know, we're always willing to experiment. If you guys have a new concept or some innovation that you want to launch in the market, like, you know, think of us. And then from a data standpoint, uh, we just rolled out our second version of our vendor portal, which has a lot more insight-driven data. Um, you know, it is a paid version, uh, but there's a lot more there. And then there's, you know, at the, at, at the core of who we are, we're a tech company, so there's tremendous amounts of data available. So while they're not present in the vendor portal, so Solely, you know, as we partner on specific opportunities, we're a little bit more transparent in, in terms of how we share there. Uh, and then three, like marketing flexibility. Um, and, you know, I think this is huge, right? So from a content perspective, like, you know, we don't use any of the CPG's content. We do all of our content in-house. We have a photo studio, so it's a lot different. Um, and, I, you know, where a lot of the you know, online retailers, even a brick and mortar, essentially have a rate card or have, you know, standard processes around it, yeah, we have that, um, but we like to also think outside the box, right, no pun intended, but, um, you know, if there isn't something strategic that you guys have or is there, if there's, a, you know, a strategic priority for the brand or something that you guys want to leverage and really drive traffic to, like, our marketing team is getting very excited about that kind of stuff. So we could think differently about a lot of things. So, you know, I don't know if you guys saw, probably four to six weeks ago, we did a, um, a, a Super Mario Brothers cereal with a Nintendo Switch giveaway. Um, you know, we blasted it all over so social, had great, um, you know, consumer engagement. Uh, we created a lot of great content around it, but essentially we did a giveaway, and it was just a really cool event, right? That was an example of something that's not on our rate card, but it was something that, you know, we, we bring brainstormed with Kellogg's, we activated around it, and uh, it led to great results. So thinking inside the box here, so um, one, 
you know, we're obviously going to be able to drive volume for you. Um, you know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that your box business is going to be bigger than your Amazon business, but what those numbers essentially represent are from, you know, a, a vendor partner of ours where we're driving that much more volume on that individual item than Amazon is, right? So where we have a curated assortment, again, we're not going to create that tail. So uh, we're really going to be able to go out there and drive and, you know, drive a ton of volume on those specific items. So when you look at these, like, 2.4x, 2.6x, so we're, you know, in the last go to 3.3x, so we're doing almost three over 300% volume on a specific item um, than, than Amazon is. So, right, I think that's important because everyone always thinks Amazon's a behemoth, in, in which they are, right? And, and, and got to give credit when credit's due. Um, but, and, and they're always going to be relevant. And I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that you don't, you know, abandon Amazon because you got you to make that thing work. But at the end of the day, um, there's also other players out there. Um, two fact, right? Vendors who get it grow faster. So everything that I just said about you know how we're different and vendors who can actually internalize Box's strategy, understand who the Box consumer is, and develop a strategy around that. Um, our conversations with those vendors are a lot different than the vendors who don't get it, right? So for example, we have vendors who essentially just extend their retail packs to us, right? Again, not what our, not what the Box consumer wants. And the question, the, the, the conversations that we have with those vendors are, oh, why aren't I growing as faster? Oh, why, are, why am I losing share? Whereas the vendors who do get it, and we have an assortment strategy around it, um, they, those conversations are like, how much bigger can we grow? What does next year look like? What else can we do? So it, it, this, is, it's, you know, this is a conversation that comes up in a lot of our vendor dialogue. And, um, you know, I, it, I, I don't, you know, I'm not essentially lying about this, right? It's either you get it or you don't, and if you do get it, then, like, go ahead, let's activate around it. Um, and then lastly, like, you know, think box first. Like, we're, we're still in, I wouldn't say our infancy, right? So we're growing now, but we're still very small. We're flexible. We're nimble. So as you guys have innovation or new item launches, you know, think of our marketing flexibility that I talked to. Uh, think about, you know, we just, you know, this is the stuff that really gets us excited. And then lastly, sorry, I got a, every presentation is better with dogs. That's my dog, so I had to, I had to put her up here. She's, uh, if you're a box shopper, you'll see her on some of our marketing content. Uh, so I had to throw her in here. And uh, so lastly, I think, um, you know, again, my, uh, a little bit more about me. So I, 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 before I came to Box, I was in the CPG world as well. So I'm very familiar with the challenges and, and, and you know, helping internalize the shift that's taking place and the changing dynamics of retail. Um, so I think, like, what, what I wanted to do here is just kind of give you guys some insight in terms of um, how you can essentially be a little bit more effective internally in selling these concepts in terms of how we need to, like, you know, double down. Everybody says they double down on e-com, right? But I mean, I think it's like really, really like, and like how do we spread this within the organization, right? So one, like, and this is the biggest thing, right? The change is driven by entrepreneurs, not the traditional retailers, right? And what I mean by that is it's Jeff Bezos, Mark Lohr, it's our CEO, Che. Like, these guys have absolutely no experience in retail, right? So, I mean, Mark and, and, and Bezos were, um, you know, investment bankers. Che was an, and he's a lawyer by trade. Um, it, found his way into gaming technology. Uh, but these are the guys who are disrupting the industry, right? So they don't – it's not – it, it, and that's, I don't know, that's the scary thing, and that's also the, the really exciting thing is that, like, you know, there's no, uh, you know, there's essentially no red tape. There's uh, there's no sacred cows. Like, these guys are going to do everything they have to do to try to really continue to disrupt this industry, and that's not going to stop anytime soon. Um, the big reason why these guys are successful, they're, they're really focusing on unmet customer needs, right? I mean, the our, you know, the population is shifting. Everyone understands that. Behaviors are shifting, and these guys are just capitalizing it. They're fast, they're flexible, and they can go just do it. Um, and, and that's something that, you know, traditional retailers essentially struggle with a little bit. Um, they're also driving new customer expect, uh, expect 
expectations, right? So, I mean, who would have thought that two-day shipping would be essentially the norm, right? And, I mean, if we think 10 years ago, like, two-day shipping was like, oh, my God, Amazon Prime built their membership model around two-day shipping, essentially. Uh, and now it's just, it's, it's expected. Um, and now we're really getting to a culture of instant gratification where things are showing up in an hour, right, solely from a shipping per perspective. But everything now, everything now is starting with the customer. Um, and that's essentially how the foundation of what Amazon started, you know, 20 plus years ago, and that's not going to change. So, um, you know, probably, and it's very, very, it, it, it's very tough, right? Of course, understanding traditional brick and mortar margins and traditional brick and mortar strategies, it really challenges the way you think differently. And then I think the the last thing that's really huge, and we see it a lot, is these smaller brands are winning, right? So, I mean, um, you look on, you know, go to Amazon categories and see who the number one is in certain categories. Like these small brands just they, they are flexible and nimble, and they're nimble and they're willing to move a lot faster. Um, and they're actually winning, right? So, I mean, uh, and it's disrupting a lot of what traditional CPG is all about. And, you know, I think there's just a couple examples out in the market, right? Like um, Unilever, um, they've done some really good things with some new brands. But, you know, they, they've understood it. And that, like, you look at the dollar shape of acquisition, right? I mean, some view that they may have overpaid, but, like, the reality of it is, is that, Dollar Shave Club has penetrated a certain part of the market that, you know, that, you know, was never done before, and they, and they recognized it, so they went out and they made an acquisition, right? P&G did something very similar with a native deodorant, right? Nobody ever thought that, you know, P&G would ever be in a you know, situation to do that, you know, a, a CPG powerhouse, but, like, you know, they realized that the, the market is shifting a little bit, so native deodorant, they, you know, spent $100 million and went and acquired them, so I think you're going to start seeing a lot more of this. You'll see, start seeing a lot more consolidation and really, you know, um, you know, at the end of the day, the, the dynamics are shifting. You guys know that. You guys know it. Everyone knows it. Um, but it's really like how do you get ahead of it versus way to react. So it's all about being proactive versus reactive. So, again, I'm not going to sit here and tell you to abandon your Amazon strategy or Jet strategy. No. Like, you need to double down everywhere. you got to figure out what makes sense for each retailer. And I can only sit here and tell you about Boxed. Um, but at the end of the day, we're different. Um, you know, we're always working you know, willing to work with people. So, um, again, if, if we're vendors or um, if we have a business to get today, thank you very much for that. And if not, if you guys have interest for it, please, uh, we'll share contact information after this and feel free to reach out. Thanks, Ankit. Thanks for being with us. Um, a lot of good stuff there. I think, I think a lot of you guys on the line um, in reviewing this, um, deck or potentially drinking from a fire hose in terms of, gosh, I, I just, I got to get my ASINs right. Um, I got Walmart brick and mortar calling me and my Walmart brick and mortar team is wanting me to, um, you know, load a bunch of stuff on walmart.com and that migrates to Jet or does it? I'm not sure. Um, all of those things are, are very real. And, you know, as Ankit goes through, um, you know, the, the um, the nuance of the box and the exciting um, kind of pieces of that. Um, you know, just keep an eye on what everybody else is doing um, in terms of the marketplace. And um, Clavis and um, and one uh, one click do a really good job of tracking. Um, and so, you know, as you're putting together uh, proposals, whether it be cross-functional within your own organization or um, really just trying to get some um, some people who aren't assigned to your team to just buy in. Um, a lot of times showing them kind of the diversity beyond Amazon is a good strategy because um, a lot of times it, it helps brand managers and other people within the organization understand that you're um, not singly focused. So um, this is something we do a lot with our clients. Oops. Next. Oh, there we go. Okay, this is an example of, um, again, it's just for, um, uh, for presentation only. Um, but essentially, I mean, you really can, and, and I'm, I'm a bit of a list person, but you really can put together um, a year to two year strategy to, to as Ankit said, double down. Um, and a lot of it doesn't have to be with special fancy internal tools. Um, it's just good, good list taking. Um, and so this is an example of a, a client that we took um, uh, on the left side is um, the assortment strategy. Um, you know, obviously, 
within the Amazon universe. Um, we wanted full long tail, but um, had a plan for different different ways that we were going to go to market um, with other places. And sorry, Anka, we had 68 here. That's just for presentation only. We would never sell 68 SKUs in the box, maybe one or two. Um, and then on the right side is, is really when we're going to get it done, um, when we're going to start optimizing, and when we're going to finish optimizing. And um, my team gives me a hard time a lot because we really love to work in Gantt charts. Um, there's, a, there's a delicate balance between uh, moving forward quickly and then also um, making sure that, that the platform that you're currently working on um, is in a healthy position to move on to the next. Um, I'm going to try to move one more. Okay. Um, this is just an example, and, and uh, Clavis and, and one click do this really well. Um, but you really can pull all of your um, different channel activity into one dashboard. Um, some of you guys can do it internally. There's different service providers that do it. Um, but all that to say, uh, if I'm sitting in your seat, and, and I did uh, for a long time, I really want to see what's happening again in my whole universe, in my, my entire um, ecosystem across platforms, um, because then I can make uh, better decisions and faster decisions. Um, a lot of times we get paralyzed with a ton of big data. And I would say a lot of indicators lie across the platform. So um, if something's happening um, on box with a particular SKU, what insights can you gain that will um, influence potentially your Sam's Club uh, in, uh, brick and mortar business or your Sam's Club online business or um, things of that nature. Um, just make sure that as you're looking at the data um, that you're not getting uh, paralyzed. And a lot of times looking across platforms um, at trends uh, is, a, is a great way to do that. Uh, last but not least, um, as you guys know, and, and this is the beauty and the pain, and again, I'm super tactical and our team pushes a lot of buttons and, and loads a lot of, a lot of code. Um, but uh, these are two examples of how platforms just behave differently. They're built on different tech stacks. Um, they receive information differently. They can be exploited differently. Um, the way their search algorithms work is different. Um, and so what I want to show you guys here is um, on the left-hand side, this is a digital asset management project um, that we've been working on uh, with a large uh, CPG where um, at any point in time, anybody in their organization can go in and uh, find, according to the particular platform that they're working on, uh, the exact specs that they need, named in the right convention, um, exactly how they need it. And, um, and when we take things into our system, we actually um, sort it out amongst all the different platforms to make sure that everything fits fits the specs. And you'd think that wasn't a big deal, but it's crazy how, um, how much faster you can move when you've got systems that are automatically transferring your things. And the, the cool thing is, is a lot of times um, companies pull those in and just automatically up, upload them. Um, I prefer, again, I'm, you can tell I'm a little bit of a control freak and want to know where everything is at all times. Um, I'd rather have those assets um, at my disposal disposal in the cloud. So that's just an example of that. The other thing is um, is really um, running an automated scorecard. So a lot of you guys probably get you know content scorecards from Salsify or Content Analytics, and those are awesome. Um, the one thing I will tell you is that they tend to give you scores on particular platforms. Um, I would say be careful because every platform has a different way of scoring. Um, so you can see here for example, um, well, on title character count for Walmart and Amazon, it's roughly the same. Um, the short description on uh, Walmart is a paragraph. Um, and Amazon bullets are only five. And uh, the long description within Walmart has an included 15 bullets. And so all the way that HTML code gets loaded up, um, you can get really hung up uh, if you try to load your same content across different places, and, and this is just an example of the complexity there and how it doesn't have to be complex, but um, you've got to know the rules and, and, and uh, when to do what. Again, it's all about speed and, and, and helping you not be so um, tied down with having to load and reload uh, due to errors. That's all I got for you guys, and, and on kit, I'm excited um, to have the opportunity to share with you, and, and Danny's probably one of my favorite people in the industry, so um, we'll open it up for Q&A. 
Well, that was fantastic, uh, both of you. Thank you so much. As a reminder, um, there is a Q&A section on the right panel of the WebEx screen. So if you have any questions that you would like to ask Ivankit or Megan, uh, please do add them there. And uh, we'll, we'll watch for those to start to queue up. And we already have a few that have come in. So one of the ones that I wanted to start with was either the theme for the webinar is really about category management and category leadership. So Ankit, I was, I was wondering for you, um, <clears throat> what, do, what do you value when a brand comes in um, in terms of beyond just pitching what products they, they want you to carry, the, the kinds of insights you're looking for, are they shopper oriented? Are they shopper behavior oriented, uh, e-commerce optimization? You know, d what, what types of insights do you really value and, and, and look for from brands? Yeah, um, good question. I think, um, you know, a lot of it, of course, is assortment related. And I think the, 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 the good, you know, a good indicator is like if we can get through assortment a lot faster and get into those more insight related discussions, that's, that's a good thing, right? So I think a lot of times we get caught up a little bit on assortment. Um, but really, like, um, yeah, I, I would love to know, like, shopper insight in terms of, like, you know, who's buying, uh, what type of consumers are, you know, buying these items, you know, if we can dig down into, like, segmentation in terms of from a millennial standpoint. So, like, a lot of insights that the CPGs have today, like, the more you could share, the more we could sit at the table together and have that, you know, determine what our certain strategy is. I think that would, that's that's really helpful. Got it. And and so following on to that, and, and this question will be for, for both of you, um, what, in your view on Kit, makes for a, a really strong item unboxed? And Megan, for you, is, you know, you had that scorecard showing assortment by retailer and commented you wouldn't have more than one or two unboxed, for example. How do you advise brands on that mix from your general mass SKUs to those that are customized for e-commerce or even more specifically for a specific retailer? So on Kit, we'll start that with you. Uh, sure, yeah. So again, like we are going to focus on, we're not going to create a tail, so we want the, you know, the best, best items essentially. Um, so I think it's very, very similar, right? So what performs well in club brick and mortar typically? as well in club online. So if we start there, that's a great indicator. So uh, again, going back to what our successful partners have been able to do is that they've been able to unlock the club assortment strategy to us, right? And like, and, and when that happens um, and when they don't essentially group us in this e-com strategy or e-com, you know, assortment, like then we're a lot more successful if we can follow the club assortment. So that's a really good starting point. It's a good question. I would say um, with regards to the box assortment, um, I'll, I'll, um, I'll juxtapose it to an Amazon strategy. So a lot of times when we take uh, new CPGs out to uh, Seattle, um, we say, listen, don't even bring samples. Um, bring your list of UPCs and it's the everything store and, and really let's make sure your operations are right and your pack sizes are right and, and we hit kind of all the basics in black and white. Um, you know, if you're lucky, you'll get a vendor manager who, you know, um, who's interested a little bit in your product, but they're managing a, you know, a billion SKUs and so it's all about um, just keeping through the system correctly. Um, in box, um, I, I tell uh, my team to make sure that we come forward with a proactive, insights-driven um, uh, assortment, um, not unlike when you potentially go to a, a Walmart buyer meeting or a, a Target um, planning meeting. Um, I would say, Ankit, you've taught me a lot that there is definitely, with the curation model, more um, opportunity to put together um, exciting packs and, and you guys are a lot more willing to work with um, uh, work with people in terms of, of showcasing. That said, um, your operations still have to be flawless when you work with Box. Um, that's 90% of, of ensuring that um, this is a good customer experience both for, um, for your customer who's buying your product and then also um, for the Box customer. All right, cool, thanks. Um, I have probably time for maybe two, two more questions here that have come in. Um, one is, uh, uh, the, one of the very hot topics right now is around uh, how smaller startup brands and digital native brands in particular have really given big CPG uh, a, a challenge online uh, in a way that we they had not previously faced in the offline brick and mortar world. So I'm curious for your perspectives on um, either what you think, I guess I'll put it in the positive context, what more could C, uh, big CPG be doing, traditional brands be doing to better compete or what mistakes do you see them making or opportunities they could be taking advantage of 
that they're not to kind of head off this threat and become just as relevant online as they've historically been for decades offline. And uh, Anke, we'll start with you and then go to Megan. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question, and it's a, it's a huge challenge, of course. So I think, um, for one, internalize what you just said, right? So I think it's just being humble about exactly the trends that are going on. And then, so first, if you could internalize that and then develop a strategy somehow around it, then that's great. And I think, you know, level set your expectations, one. Like, you know, there are new brands in the market, so, like, your share and performance in your category trends over the last 40 years are going to be different for the next 40 years. So, again, it's really understanding uh, exactly what's going to happen. Um, I, I think some of the things why the new brands are succeeding is, one, they're talking to a different audience, right? They're talking to um, this millennial audience, and, and their brands just connect, right? So when you think about it from a brand awareness marketing strategy, like, that's got to be a pretty big thing, and, like, you can't necessarily um, just – you know, continue essentially the, the, what the marketing has looked like for the last 30 years. I think a good example of it is P&G and the Old Spice campaign, right? If you think whatever, five, ten years ago when they relaunched that, I mean, that was essentially a dying brand, but they've really revived it. So they took this legacy brand and they've really created a really cool campaign. So a lot of it is from a branding perspective, I think. Um, and I think, again, the reason why these small companies are – in the second – so the second thing is this, uh, understanding the trends as well, right? So a lot of, from a food perspective, you know, everything is organic, oh, all this and that. So, like, that's changing a little bit, which essentially possess, it possesses a challenge for, you know, a lot of the brands that I grew up with and a lot of the cereals that I ate. And, like, the, you know, the culture, unfortunately, is that, you know, like, sugars are, are not as prevalent anymore. So I think just given a lot of the awareness, it just puts the brands in a very difficult perspective in a lot of ways. Uh, but it, it really, it's, it's a challenge, and there's no easy solution, and every solution's different, every situation's different. Um, but a very, very just, you know, the, the more you can essentially adapt to the times and, and, and really get away from, like, the legacy behavior, um, you know, I think that, it, it, it all goes back to the mindset and mentality of to really understand the change that's occurring in the business and just how quickly you have to do it. So. Hey, I would say, Anke, that's a, um, I love the perspective from an insight. Um, Danny, I'm definitely a little more in the weeds, and I think it takes both sides. Um, I'll, I'll use an example. My 13-year-old um, has a little resale business online, and, um, you know, he, he moves shoes. Um, he buys them at Ross, and he resells them on, on Amazon third party and eBay. He is watching his shoes and his competition every single day. Um, granted, he's only moving, you know, a few shoes across, but I liken that to the way that um, a lot of these small guys are doing it. They just have an, an, an incessant, exciting uh, urge to, um, to learn. Um, and they're, they're watching their stuff every day. And so when I talked to big CPGs um, earlier, like I said about this universe, um, I get a lot of brand managers that just look at me like I have three heads and that if it's not part of their current active brand portfolio, then it doesn't exist. And when you flip that on its head and start thinking like a 13-year-old who's making a hell of a lot of money selling shoes online, um, and, and he's always looking out, and he, he doesn't understand that, that who owns what, when, where, how, and why. All he's trying to do is get his product in the right place at the right time so the right consumer gets it. And I just I love that, um, that juxtaposition. And I, you know, I've, I've been in large, large CPG that moves slowly. Um, and, and you can still have that, that, um, that upstart mindset, um, especially with some, some cross-collaboration. Um, there's a lot of free tools out there. There's a lot of great partners. Um, and there's a lot of, honestly, interns and high schoolers that probably get it a lot better than us. Got it. That's fantastic. So I'm going to just wrap up with one last one for Ankit, and then we'll wrap this up for today. Uh, there was an announcement today, I believe you alluded to it, about a new subscription program. And I was just wondering if you could share any more insight into uh, what led Box to introduce that and, and what you're hoping for from the program. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's a very valid question, of course, given the timing. So, um, you know, I think I'll start off by saying that um, in any article that you read, our CEO said, you know, as long as he's controlling the keys, like, there's always going to be a free option, right? So this is never a mandatory thing. We always want customers to, you know, not have a barrier to essentially try box, and we always want to provide um, a free oppor opportunity, a non-membership-related opportunity. So that's really important to us. Um, but I think, like, 
really comes down to is, you know, we have a loyal set of customers, and we essentially wanted a way to, you know, to reward them, right? So, I mean, I think, um, you know, they're, they, of course, love Box, um, but we want to reward them for love and Box. So, at the end of the day, like, yeah, there's a charge associated with this membership, but, I mean, a couple of the things that, you know, they're going to get, they're obviously going to get a reduced shipping tier, um, and then they will get, you know, cashbacks rewards, and they have, you know, some sort of order prioritization. And then as we think about things that we roll out, like, over the years, like, you know, we'll probably create, you know, we'll have the mindset of creating a, you know, how do we incent our loyal cons- customers a little bit more, and, um, you know, how do we also provide a great service to customers who aren't members? Um, you know, and I think membership is one of those, you know, we're going to experiment with it, and, and let's see what it does, right? Of course, I mean, you know, Walmart abandoned, or they, you know, the, the shipping pass, and, you know, Jet essentially abandoned their membership model, but at the end of the day, I mean, you got an Amazon Prime, and you have Costco that are very successful, so there are great examples examples of membership models in the market, um, and I think it's one of those things that we're going to, um, you know, go in and, and, you know, work like hell to, to make it work, and, you know, at the end of the day, if customers don't adopt to it, then that, that tells us one thing, but, at the, you know, but if customers do enjoy it and they like it, then that tells us another. So, um, at the end of the day, um, I would say, to summarize it, it's really to incent loyalty, and it's just to incent our loyal customers. Fantastic. Well, it certainly looks exciting and, and on trend with what shoppers are looking for. Um, so, Ankit and Megan, thank you so much for your time and insights today. And I'm going to hand it back to Paul to close us out for the day with a few upcoming uh, uh, in, uh, active uh, events that are coming up for us. Perfect. Thanks, Danny and, and Megan. Ankit, uh, definitely uh, some really exciting uh, insights there. A uh, few items as we uh, leave today. Uh, there will be a, a survey which will appear uh, in your main window as you leave the webinar. Please do take the time to complete the survey. Let us know your thoughts about the content, uh, the presentation, and more importantly, it's your opportunity also to ask for more information on Clavis Insight, um, the box store, or OneStone. Uh, as a special thank you for completing the survey, you'll receive a copy of Clavis's newest white paper, Driving Online Channel Growth with 6P E-Commerce Intelligence. Uh, we have a number of upcoming events, uh, live events coming down the pike. Certainly our next e-commerce accelerator summit will be taking place April 24th and 25th uh, in New York City. Uh, registration for that will actually close next week on the 18th. So if you're interested in attending, certainly do um, you know, register as soon as you can. Uh, we'll also have an e-commerce accelerator summit with one-click retail uh, in London on June 6th, uh, as well as uh, additional Amazon hackathons uh, coming up uh, in Amazon in the fall, as well as in London. And as you mentioned earlier, the next installment of our webinar series with OneStone will take place on May 3rd uh, with uh, Carmelo Cagini from uh, Walmart and Jet. Uh, thank you all again uh, for attending today's webinar. Uh, if you want any information uh, on any of our sponsors today, you can certainly uh, visit our websites or uh, email them by the emails uh, provided. Thank you all once again, and have a wonderful rest of the day. Goodbye.